everybody. I'm very glad to see so many people here, indeed, in vacation season, in uh, exam season, and still I see quite a lot of young people, undergraduates here, um, coming to listen to this talk, so that's uh, fantastic. Um, I'm also very pleased to be here, to be back here in India. In fact, our first ever IAU symposium on astrochemistry was held here in uh, India in 1985 in Goa, just uh, south of here. So there's also a lot of history of astrochemistry and, and uh, sort of memories of India where a lot of this uh, got started. So, um, I'm going to take you indeed on a detective story. Those are already the exact words that I was going to use. A detective story actually through interstellar space, through the space between the stars, um, in order to see sort of what the role is, how these, these macroscopic bodies that you see on the, on the sky, uh, how stars, how planets, how entire galaxies, how they are actually formed from a very tenuous gas that we see here between the stars. Very, very tenuous. And in which a lot of microscopic processes between the atoms and molecules uh, actually play a crucial role in order to make that happen, the formation of those very big bodies that we now see on the sky. And especially, of course, the question ultimately that we're interested in is where do planets like our Earth uh, come from? Now, before I do that, uh, I want to make a, a small digression uh, because I have as a uh, hobby, actually, uh, astronomy and art. Um, so I like to collect sort of uh, paintings from all around the world um, that have to do something with uh, astronomy, where astronomy has been an inspiration. And of course, uh, in the Netherlands, uh, having our painter Vincent van Gogh, uh, with the Starry Nights, is uh, clearly uh, 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 a nice example of that that you can go all across the world. Um, this is one of my favorite ones uh, from Australia, from the Aboriginals, who of course have the beautiful sky, uh, the southern sky uh, above them to look at. They see the Milky Way gorgeous every night uh, on, the, on the skies. And so there actually, sort of, they have these dreamings, the Milky Way dreaming, in which sort of the, the, um, the Milky Way has become part of their cosmology, of their way of life, actually. And what you see here is one of the paintings in which you see the spiral arms of our galaxy, but here also the seven sisters that were actually hidden here in the heart of this uh, galaxy where most of the dust is the obscuration uh, because they were chased by this, uh, uh, by this star here, Orion, uh, this old man that was chasing them. So they were hiding uh, there from him. Um, can anybody in the audience actually see why this is a painting that was uh, painted on the southern sky? <laughs> Orion is above actually uh, the Pleiades. If you would see it from here, from India, then you would see sort of them the other way around. So this is also very nice to, to, to sort of see what is, uh, what is happening. Um, this is another story, um, the raven actually stealing the sun, this is from the Pacific Northwest in Canada, um, where uh, the, the story goes that actually the moon had put the uh, sun in a dark box, and uh, that first raven was actually the one who got the sun out of the box um, and put it uh, on the sky uh, to, give, uh, to give light. And here is yet another part from uh, the German uh, expressionist, uh, here Kandinsky, actually, called stars, but you see here already a little bit well before we knew that that was going to be the right explanation of stars sitting here in a dark cloud and being really born inside these dark, uh, uh, these dark regions. And of course, here in India, you also have many examples of sort of uh, uh, stars being an inspiration for art, as you see uh, over here. Okay, but the point is that it's not just astronomers who are interested in these big questions as to where do we come from, what is our place in the universe, but that you see that actually sort of throughout society, um, including also in the arts. Now, there has been a big uh, development in astronomy over the last uh, 20 uh, or so years, and that has been the discovery of planets around other stars. People have always speculated for centuries, for, for tens of centuries, that uh, there were planets around other stars. But the scientific proof that there are really planets around other stars, that our sun, 
Um, that came only um, in the last uh, 20 years. And these so-called exoplanets, meaning planets circling another star than our sun, um, has actually led to a lot of fundamental questions becoming very relevant again. Again, age-old questions that we now can put sort of on a scientific footing, such as where and how are these stars and planets born? How unique is our solar system? Well, the discovery of these exoplanets already tells us that you know, we're not the only planetary system in the universe, um, but how do they actually look? How do the other planetary systems look look our own solar system? And which of these planets could be habitable? So here you see some of the um, observations that were used to discover these exoplanets. One of them is basically tracing the light uh, from the star, and because there is a, whenever there is a planet going around the star, then it will um, result in the star not being exactly at the same position, um, but uh, wobbling a little bit around its center of mass here, and that you see sort of in the, the, uh, the changing of the uh, radiation color, actually, uh, in our telescopes. Uh, another one that you know very well is sort of the transit. Uh, think of the Venus transit that really happened uh, not so long ago, when a planet goes in front of the sun, and you see a little dip here in the light. So through these kinds of uh, observations from various telescopes and satellites, uh, we now know that there's an incredible diversity of these planets. Uh, they come in all kinds of sizes. Some of them are bigger than Jupiter, some of them are actually smaller than Jupiter, but bigger than Earth. And some of them are of a kind which we have no equivalent in our own solar system. So all of these questions are now as to how they are formed, where uh, this diversity originates from, are now becoming very relevant again. And of course, the biggest question of all is the sort of the billion dollar or uh, billions of dollars uh, rupees uh, question. Um, how were we actually formed some four and a half billion years ago? And we get that from our astronomical observations, but we also get that from um, sort of remnants of our formation process in our own solar system. And those remnants can be either meteorites that fall in the sky quite regularly, from the sky actually on the Earth uh, quite regularly, and that tell us something from uh, the parent body, what they came from, and especially about processes that happen in our early solar system. Um, and then the comets, which are sort of messengers from the cold outer part of our solar system, um, which called icy part, actually, um, which we can also study. And this has become very relevant with the recent mission from the European Space Agency, the Rosetta mission, which actually studied one particular comet in detail and also for the first time in uh, human uh, history actually landed uh, on a uh, comet. So these are basically messengers from the Oregon Solar System, and I will come back to them at the uh, end of my lecture. So just a little bit of orientation as to what I'm going to talk about. Um, so here we see sort of an impression of what our own Milky Way, our own collection of stars, uh, uh, looks like our own galaxy, uh, basically a collection of a few hundred billion stars. And our sun is just one of these few hundred billion stars that are present in our Milky Way. And if we will be able to look uh, from the top uh, on our Milky Way, then we would see a structure that is like this. This is actually based on real astronomical data uh, with some of these, these arms, basically, uh, on which we see uh, most of the stars actually lying. But the point is that our sun here is just one of these few hundred billion stars somewhere in the outskirts of this galaxy, uh, and uh, of which there are several hundred uh, billions in this galaxy. And then, again, our galaxy is not the only galaxies, there are also several hundred billions of these um, galaxies in the universe. So you can see already that um, maybe we're not so special if uh, uh, there are so many hundreds of billions of stars and also hundreds of billions of galaxies. So um, let's start our journey and uh, let's look actually where we find uh, these burst places of stars and planets. So when you look up at the sky at night, uh, you see the stars, um, you see maybe a, a 
couple of planets. Uh, Jupiter is very prominent actually at this, uh, this moment. Um, but maybe you haven't asked sort of the question as to what is actually in between those stars. Now for a long time, even the astronomers thought that that space was completely empty. But since a little over a century ago, we know that that space is not empty, but it's filled with a very, very, very dilute gas. And it's actually the somewhat denser concentrations of that gas that are called clouds. You can think a little bit of the clouds that we also have in our atmosphere, but they're much more tenuous. Um, and it is in these so-called clouds, these denser concentration of this gas, that we actually have the stars that are being born. So let's look at uh, some of these uh, regions in which stars are formed. So this is a constellation that you probably all uh, recognize. All right. right, yes, okay. Um, so here you see, uh, sort of, that's the, the hunter. Uh, so here you see the upper part of the body of the, the hunter, and then you see here his belt and his sword, and then here in the uh, part of the sword is where actually the uh, Orion Nebula is. And that Nebula was already seen by Galileo and Huygens uh, many centuries ago, um, but now we can look at it with our most uh, powerful telescopes. And this is just one image uh, of that Orion Nebula, if you really zoom into it, um, and then we see that actually this nebula contains, uh, it's a nursery actually of several thousands of new stars that are being born uh, at this very moment. Now actually, sort of these nebulae, um, they were speculated already to be the sort of the chaotic material of future suns by William Herschel, uh, again, many centuries ago. But still, it was not until the 1950s that astronomers realized that stars don't live forever, that stars are actually born and that they also die off. Um, and so only then sort of this whole uh, concept of formation of stars started to take off um, as a science and uh, study. So here we have the Orion Nebula as uh, seen by the, the Hubble Space Telescope. So here is the part of the nebula that we were looking at uh, previously. Now you see a much larger region. You see the beautifully colorful image that you have here. Uh, this is the ionized gas. This is actually very hot gas. This is not the gas that we will be uh, uh, talking about today. Um, but we will be talking actually about these dark regions that you see here on these uh, images. And let's look at a few more. Here is a, a beautiful sort of uh, little animation of some, some of these dark clouds um, that uh, are in the Carina Nebula, <coughs> the, the southern sky. Um, and these clouds are actually so dark, you see them against a background uh, nebula, bright nebula. And they are actually so dark because they all contain not just gas, but also tiny, tiny little dust particles. And these dust particles can absorb and they can scatter the light, um, just like when you're in a smoke, smoky cafe or a region, then you also know that you cannot look very far into that room because the smoke particles basically uh, absorb and scatter the light. And that's actually what you see here as well. Now these, uh, um, these clouds are actually some of the largest entities that we have in our uh, galaxies. Uh, their sizes can be up to several <coughs> light years in diameter. Um, they also can contain quite a lot of mass, and they are also some of the most massive objects that we have in our galaxies, up to 100,000 times the mass of our sun. Um, so in principle, one such cloud has enough material to form maybe a hundred thousand stars like our own. It won't do that. It will do it actually with a very low efficiency of only a few percent. That's just the raw material for building planets is present there in, in great amounts. Okay, so let's zoom in on a small part of one of these uh, dark clouds. Uh, they're also called uh, coal sacks because with the naked eye you can sometimes see them uh, look as coal sacks against sort of the bright Milky Way. And you have to go a little bit away from Pune to a very uh, dark region, uh, but then you can uh, see some of these uh, uh, coal sacks also with your, your naked eye uh, if you're lucky. Um, so what do they actually consist of? Um, they consist mostly of gas, um, and that gas is mostly hydrogen. I will come back uh, to that uh, in just a moment. Uh, but then 1% by mass is these tiny little dust particles. 
uh, and you have to think of them as, as tiny little uh, pieces of sand, actually, uh, consisting of silicate material and also carbonaceous uh, material, so containing uh, carbon. And they are sort of only a, a fraction in size, a fraction of sort of uh, the, the width of a human uh, hair. Um, temperatures are very cold here in these regions, just, you know, 10 Kelvin about, uh, sorry, 10, 10 degrees above the absolute zero. Um, so in this room, it is something like, uh, um, something like 25 degrees Celsius. Uh, so that corresponds on this scale. And with several hundred degrees then uh, above zero. And so here we are only a few degrees above the absolute zero. <coughs> the density is also extremely low, of the order of 10,000 particles per cubic centimeter. Now, what does that mean? Here in this room again, we have of the order of 10 to the 19 particles per cubic centimeter. And even if you go in your laboratory, among the topologists, in where you have a high vacuum uh, setup, you still have of the order of uh, at least 100 million, uh, maybe 100, 100 million of particles per cubic centimeter. So when an astronomer talks about a dense cloud, it's really much, much, much more empty uh, than anything that we have in the laboratory here on Earth. So what that means basically is that uh, these clouds are not just interesting for astronomers, but they are also actually very interesting for chemists like myself. I'm originally a chemist, uh, now I'm an astronomer, but I <laughs> have chemical roots. Um, and uh, uh, also a unique physical laboratory where conditions are very different uh, from those normally encountered in the laboratory on Earth. So that makes it such a fun and multidisciplinary topic to work in. Okay, so. Um, how do we actually find out what is happening inside these clouds? So again, here we have our dark cloud, and we see here in the optical, we see something dark, because the dust particles here obscure the light from the stars behind them. But now, if I start to put on different glasses, um, and I go to somewhat longer wavelengths, if I go to the infrared part of the spectrum, then actually you start to see through the clouds, you start to see now also the background stars, the stars that are behind uh, the cloud. And so by going to longer wavelengths, we can actually study what is happening actually inside these clouds. So let's look at uh, a little animation. This is based on real data from this telescope here, the Speeds of Space Telescope. Um, and what we saw was a uh, dark cloud, uh, uh, originally uh, um, in the optical, and what we did was actually zoom from the visible to the infrared light. So let's go back and show that once more. So here we have the dark cloud. Now we are shifting actually to longer and longer wavelengths. And what we see is we now start to look through the clouds and we see that actually inside that cloud, there is a young star forming at this particular moment. That young star actually has a, uh, a bipolar flow. It has uh, basically uh, trying to push away its uh, surrounding uh, material um, and in that way, uh, sort of emerge from its natal cocoon. But it's clear that you actually need long wavelengths to penetrate these dusty regions. Okay, so then the question is, what kind of facilities do we have available in order to study these, uh, these dark clouds? Um, and so we will talk about some telescopes on Earth, but certainly in this part of the electromagnetic spectrum, um, the, uh, um, the Sort of, a lot of the uh, signals from the uh, universe are actually blocked by our own atmosphere. So a large part of the infrared window is basically uh, uh, blocked uh, due to our own atmosphere. And so we need to go above the atmosphere, and that means that we need to build satellites. Uh, and there have been a few very powerful satellites since the mid-1990s, so in that sense it's a relatively young science that we really have had the technology in order to, to do this, uh, the Infrared Space Observatory, uh, the Spitzer Space Telescope, and then the latest in this series was the Herschel Space Observatory, which is actually the largest uh, astronomical telescope that has ever flown, three and a half meter diameter, so even larger than the, the, sort of the telescope diameter than the uh, Hubble Space Telescope. And so all of these, uh, um, um, 
satellites have been equipped with very powerful instruments, and so as astronomers, we've been very fortunate to be able to use these instruments then to do our science. And for me as a chemist, what is particularly important from these space missions is that the signals from some of the most important molecules like water, like molecular oxygen, like CO2, the molecules that uh, we need for life and or that are a signature of life, are actually completely blocked by our atmosphere because uh, our own atmosphere contains so much water and O2 and CO2. Good, and just to show you the technology project, a progress over the last uh, 50 years. Uh, this is a, an image that you would take of such a star forming region in the infrared part of the, the spectrum in uh, 1976. And uh, here is some of the beautiful images that the Herschel Space Observatory has provided us of these uh, star forming regions. And so here we really sort of can identify the individual sort of protostars, as we call them. Um, sitting here, you see here you whole clusters of these uh, protostars, the young stars that are actually forming here deep inside uh, this, uh, this cloud. So that's what we can do in space, that's wonderful, um, but uh, we cannot send very big telescopes into space, uh, the largest is so far is three and a half uh, meters, and so to go to bigger and bigger telescopes you have to do it from the ground, even if you're view of phase is somewhat limited by the uh, atmosphere. And so here is some collection of uh, very powerful telescopes uh, across the world, the so-called 8 to 10 meter class telescopes, uh, either from the European Southern Observatory or the Keck Telescope or the Gemini uh, collaboration uh, that have these telescopes uh, either in Chile or in uh, Mauna Kea in Hawaii. And there are now big plans <laughs> on the way to build sort of the next generation of these very large telescopes where we're making the jump from say 8 to 10 meters to something like 30 to 40 meters in uh, diameter. So perhaps uh, by uh, sort of uh, the middle of the next decade we might see sort of the first images from these next generation of uh, big telescopes. So these were telescopes uh, that you actually uh, uh, that observed objects with the light that you see also with your own eyes, and the optical part of the, the spectrum. Um, but there's also the radio telescopes, and you're very familiar with them. Uh, here, just very near Pune, is the giant uh, meter wave uh, radio telescope, the GMOT. That's a radio telescope working at centimeter uh, wavelengths, um, and uh, then uh, each of these telescopes actually receives the signals from space, but then you also combine the signals from these different telescopes uh, in order to get a sharper view, actually, of uh, your uh, astronomical uh, object. Now, that's the same what we do, actually, uh, at somewhat shorter wavelengths, at millimeter wavelengths. So centimeter wavelengths is wonderful for studying all kinds of uh, astronomical phenomena, but not so much to study uh, the star formation and the uh, chemistry that I'm going to talk about. So for that we need actually the Atacama Large Millimeter Array. Uh, that's sort of the uh, culmination of a lot of efforts um, that have been going on in various countries uh, to sort of build the next generation of uh, facilities at millimeter wavelengths. Um, and so this is the first worldwide collaboration that we actually have in astronomy. Uh, it brings together East Asia, um, uh, North America here, and Europe uh, to jointly bring, build actually this uh, wonderful facility here on a high altitude plane in uh, northern Chile. And so what you see here is uh, uh, 54 dishes of 12 meter, um, and then also the number of smaller antennas that together uh, cover actually this, uh, this wavelength range. This wavelength range is important because that is basically where we can see both the cold dust clouds in dust and gas clouds in which these new stars are forming and this is also where molecules actually in it, most of their lines by the fact that they tumble and over end in space um, and that uh, means that they radiate actually um, at wavelengths that are in the uh, wavelength range. So putting this uh, project together was actually a fantastic technological uh, uh, feat also. Uh, it's a testimony to the high-tech technology, both in terms of the 
receivers, sort of the eyes of Alma. They are really state-of-the-art uh, uh, receivers uh, in order to uh, uh, receive the very uh, weak signals from space. Uh, and also in terms of electronics and the computers, uh, and then also all of these dishes, very high precision dishes, uh, that had to be put together. So here you see the uh, logistical challenge. Uh, this is sort of the mid-level facility of Alma, uh, where the telescopes were assembled. So basically all the parts came together from different parts of the world. They were put together, then they were put on a gigantic truck, and they were driven then up from 3,000 meters up to 5,000 meters, and then basically being put into the uh, array. Um, and so uh, I could say that uh, to me now to have this uh, array together is really fantastic. And it's, uh, I'd say it's also a, a breathtaking experience, uh, most literally and figuratively, uh, to be up there at the 5,000 meter altitude play as to where these uh, telescopes are now located. <coughs> And we'll see some uh, exciting new results from ALMA in uh, a few minutes uh, later in the talk. Okay, good. So that's how we actually observe molecules. Now, a little bit of chemistry in the next uh, several minutes. Um, so this is basically the astronomer's view of the periodic table. So um, the universe is basically dominated by hydrogen, it's in the Big Bang. Uh, some fraction of helium, about 10% by number, uh, but you probably know from your high school chemistry uh, that helium uh, doesn't like to make molecules. So for the chemistry, it's much more interesting to have these elements, carbon, nitrogen, and oxygen, which are ever, however, down by several orders of magnitude. So they are now present at the level of a fraction of a percent per mil uh, with respect to hydrogen. So we have this very tenuous and very cold gas. We have a gas that consists mostly of hydrogen, just here and there are carbon and oxygen. These may meet each other maybe once a month, maybe once every thousand years. So chemists in the 1960s said to the astronomers, you know, don't bother even to start looking for molecules in interstellar space because you won't find them. You know, these are not the conditions in which you have chemistry. Unfortunately, the uh, over dioxide, but also already some quite complex organic molecules, like here, uh, dimethyl ether. And so, indeed, uh, over the years, uh, more than 180 different molecules have been found. We are closing in on uh, 200. Um, some of them are ordinary molecules, molecules that you can buy in a bottle, uh, like ammonia, like uh, water, like formaldehyde, like this molecule, ethanol, that you may know also. And so. Uh, you can <laughs> think that uh, maybe uh, if you want to drink a beer, you could also uh, go and take an interstellar space uh, travel and um, get it. It's not 40%, it's uh, only 1% or so. <laughs> um, but then instead of these ordinary, besides these ordinary molecules, you also have a number of quite exotic molecules. Exotic meaning molecules that are quite abundant in interstellar space, but are difficult for to make in a laboratory on Earth. And these are molecules uh, that are called radicals or ions that are very short-lived under uh, Earth's conditions because they always collide very quickly with something else. But in interstellar space, they won't collide for a long time and they are actually very stable molecules. So they are unusual molecules, they are rare on Earth, but not uh, in space. So here is uh, basically protonated carbon monoxide, protonated N2, so CO and N2, very important interstellar molecules, but then also these very long carbon chains. So HC7N, HC9N, so all of these carbons is just one hydrogen and one nitrogen. And this in spite of the fact that we have so much more hydrogen than carbon. So this tells us immediately that the chemistry is not in what you would call thermodynamic equilibrium, but that it is really controlled sort of by the, uh, the kinetics between the various <laughs> So here are some of the complex organic molecules that have been detected uh, in uh, space. Um, so here is the ethanol that we talked about already, dimethyl ether, acetic acid, uh, simple sugar molecule, I'll come back to that in a moment. Uh, benzene has also been detected. Uh, but probably more important, there are various uh, 
sort of molecules that we think are sort of the molecular bricks for life that are at least involved in living species here on, on Earth, uh, which are uh, amino acids <laughs> like glycine, uh, or the bases that are parts of DNA like bacteria and purine. So in spite of very dedicated searches and sometimes even claims in the press, uh, the simplest amino acid has not yet been uh, uh, identified in interstellar space. And this little molecule here is, of course, a molecule that's maybe not so important for the origin of life, but certainly important for the maintenance of life. <laughs> various parts of the world. But the point is that some of these molecules are not so much more complex than the ones that we have found already. Um, and so we really have good hopes that this ALMA, we can check really how far this kind of complexity goes, that we can dig deeper uh, into sort of uh, the, uh, uh, the, the molecular complexity and, and really start to identify or at least put good limits on the presence of these important molecules like amino acids. And in fact, ALBA has already started to uh, detect new molecules, not yet the amino acids, but some molecules that are closely related to that, uh, such as some of the side chain molecules that you see here, this molecule called isopropyl cyanide uh, that is seen here towards the galactic uh, center. And also the first chiral molecule, uh, a molecule that can be both left-handed and right-handed, uh, has actually been identified in interstellar space in uh, the last uh, year. So going still even further in molecular complexity, um, we know that there are so-called polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons in space. Um, so this is now a class of molecules for which we don't know exactly the molecular identification. All the ones that I showed you before, we know exactly what the shape of the molecule is and uh, its identification. In this case, we only know that these molecules are present as a class of the molecules, but not whether it's this particular form uh, or some other form with fewer or more uh, carbon or hydrogen uh, atoms. But they have as a characteristic <coughs> that they have these uh, aromatic bonds here uh, that seem to be uh, actually as part of their structure. And then also um, a story that was actually inspired by interstellar chemistry by these long carbon chains. Um, if you make them longer and longer, they will start to fold into themselves and they will turn into these so called fullerenes, uh, which the most stable forms are C60 and C70. And uh, these molecules have now also been identified in interstellar space uh, a few years ago. So these are called buckyballs that now play a very important role uh, also in the chemistry on Earth. Besides the molecules in the gas, we also have uh, molecules present on these uh, dust particles because these dust particles actually are very cold, so they act a little bit as a deep freeze. Uh, when a molecule from the uh, outer space uh, actually uh, in space actually collides with such a distance, uh, dust grain, then it will actually freeze out onto the dust grains, it will hit and stick, uh, and then other uh, chemical reactions can occur. You can compare this with uh, a cold winter night, although I'm not sure you have such cold winter nights here in Pune, um, where, uh, you know, in the morning you would find an icy layer on your uh, windshield, uh, because the molecules from the, uh, water molecules from the atmosphere have actually condensed out on that surface. Um, so uh, well, once that's on the surface, then you can actually have other reactions happening, and in particular what will happen is you form a lot of water, um, you turn oxygen into water, you turn carbon into CH4, you turn nitrogen into ammonia, and you turn carbon monoxide into methanol. So actually, uh, and you also have uh, some CO2 that is formed here, so you can see that we can actually have uh, uh, a little bit of uh, uh, bubbles here in our interstellar cocktail. Now, a lot of these uh, processes we are actually trying to simulate in the laboratory on Earth, and we're doing that, that actually is happening in various laboratories across, uh, uh, across the world. I understand there's also a cosmic laboratory uh, here in uh, Pune. Um, in Leiden, we have the Sackler Laboratory for Astrophysics, uh, in which we are trying to simulate these processes on interstellar dust grains at very low temperatures. Uh, the only thing we cannot simulate is the very low densities, because then the processes would take some 100,000 years to occur, um, and our PhD students only have four years, so <laughs> <laughs> we need to speed that clock up a little bit so that they can do their uh, experiments in a day, um, but uh, then uh, otherwise we can translate them to the wrong uh, uh, time scales in, uh, in 
space. So combining all that knowledge that we have from the laboratory and also theoretical simulations, we have made a simulation. So this is based on real, real laboratory data, so how we think that water is actually formed in grains. So maybe once a day, a hydrogen atom lands on a grain, on one of the dust particles. There you see it lands, it scans the surface, ah, finds of another partner, electro hydrogen it goes off. That's how electro hydrogen is made. You can also find an oxygen, that's the red ones. You see water already here, ah, there it makes molecular oxygen. Uh, now it makes actually hydrogen peroxide, <coughs> which is what you see happening over here. And then uh, another hydrogen comes in and it actually to water one. And now we fast forward the clock and we do this for 10,000 years or so, and then we make our icy layer on the dust grain. And this is actually the process through which most of the water in space is actually uh, formed. And then the water molecules that you see here in this class, uh, actually their bonds were formed first uh, some four and a half billion years ago uh, prior to the formation of our own solar system. Okay, good. So um, that's uh, sort of the chemistry part. Now we can also start to observe it with uh, our satellites. And this is some beautiful results that we obtained with the Herschel satellite, the signature actually of water in a region in which new stars and planets are being born. And from the strength of this signal, we can actually translate that into the number of molecules that are present. And the most useful uh, unit to use for water is actually oceans, <laughs> because that's something you can relate to. And so this signal actually <coughs> corresponds, uh, indicates the presence of some 6,000 oceans of, of water, gas, and ice actually being present in this region in which new stars and planets are being born. So that's quite a lot. It means that there's a large reservoir actually of water available. Now, the, <laughs> the importance of this research has not gone unnoticed. Um, that was even picked up by the, the Big Bang Theory, and you see that we are talking about water and also about uh, uh, ionized uh, water. Good. So, summary so far interstellar clouds have a very rich chemical composition in spite of these cold and tenuous conditions. And seconds, most water and also complex organic molecules are actually found around nearly all of the uh, forming stars and throughout the entire Milky Way, and presumably also in other galaxies in the universe. So this means that the building blocks for prebiotic material are actually widespread. Good, so now a little bit about the physics of uh, star formation. So how is actually a new planetary system formed? Here we have a cloud again, um, and basically what happens is that cloud can uh, stay for quite some time, but then through some perturbation, and uh, sometimes we don't even know exactly what it is, uh, it can actually start to collapse under its own weight, and then it will produce a, a star. So let's look, go back to our Orion uh, Nebula, and let's look at a nice uh, animation, actually that was made some time ago by Chris O'Dell. Um, uh, there's a supercomputer at that time in which he took the images from the Hubble Space Telescope that we saw earlier in this talk um, and actually turned them into a 3D image. And what you see here is actually several of these so-called protostars um, as we fly through this Orion Nebula. And here we now go into an animation and what we see now is that uh, once the cocoon in which these young stars are formed is removed and we see here actually the young star itself is this rotating disk uh, of gas and dust uh, around it. Good, so let's actually look at that one more time. So here we have our uh, uh, Gambit stars that we saw earlier in one of the first uh, images. And uh, now we're gonna sort of do a, a little travel through interstellar space, through the Orion Nebula. Would be wonderful if we could do that ourselves as scientists and just scoop up a little bit of this Orion Nebula to analyze it. But we have to do it all from remote uh, sensing. So here we see our protostars, and now we go here to the animation. Um, and then we see that the cocoon is basically blown away by the winds uh, from the young stars and by the radiation from the surrounding stars. And now we see here the young star with this rotating disk of gas and dust, the natural outcome of the star formation process, and again these jets that try to blow away uh, some of the surroundings. So these disks are actually very important um, because uh, they are the, uh, the regions in which the new planets are actually formed. But the problem is that they are very small. So here we have our clouds, 
and these are sort of these units. Uh, then we have sort of the small region that collapses, which is a factor of 10 smaller. Um, and then here is our disk in a sort of animation cartoon. And uh, if we would put this on the same scale, then it would become as small as a little, yes, a little pin here on this, uh, on this image. So, factor of 100 lower. Um, and that means really that we needed sort of the power of these new telescopes like ALMA in order to be able to zoom in into these regions. And this is exactly what ALMA has done. These are now some random data from the ALMA telescope where we have targeted all of the young stars, basically in one star forming region called Lupus. Uh, you see here the wolf, Lupus. Um, and uh, you see all of these disks basically appear. ALMA can do these, make these kinds of images now in just one or two minutes uh, per source. And so we can really sort of tar start to test sort of these, uh, um, these theories of what is the result of these surveys? Well, basically, they tell us that nearly all young stars are surrounded by disks, that the sizes of these disks are comparable to that of our own solar system, meaning of the order of, uh, say, uh, if we go out to Neptune, uh, some 30 astronomical units, or 30 times the distance of the Sun to the Earth, um, so comparable to that of the solar, solar, solar system, and that the masses of these disks are often enough to form a solar system like our own. So how much do we need to form a solar system like our own? Uh, about 1% of the mass of the sun, about 10 times the mass of Jupiter, if we want to form really a, a, a substantial solar system. In any case, what this tells us in these data is that the ingredients for planet formation are also so, what have we now started to do is, uh, Alma, we've started to zoom in on some of these very young disks, and we've tried, we're trying now to determine their chemical composition, because Alma allows us to go from this very big scale now to really zoom in on sort of the size of our own uh, solar system. So this is uh, about uh, sort of the order of Neptune. And even in very early Alma data, when the telescope had just come online, we already found uh, very interesting signatures more complex molecules here in the analogs of our own uh, solar system, like this little sugar here um, that you see here called glycosaldehyde. Um, this molecule had been seen previously on large scales in massive star forming regions like the galactic uh, center or in Orion, but never in sort of the analog of our own uh, young solar system. And so that is what ALMA now allows us to do, is really zoom in to what our own young solar system may have looked like. And so this was one of the first detections that we got here, this uh, little sugar molecule. Uh, incidentally, don't put this uh, kind of uh, molecule into your coffee or tea, uh, because it's actually quite toxic. <laughs> the, the real sugar is a more complicated uh, uh, molecule, but it has the same basic units as, uh, as this molecule. And so by now, Alma has done a complete survey in uh, one of its frequency bands of this region. So previously, we were covering this part of the spectrum. Now we have this complete uh, scan of this region, and we, we found already more than 10,000 lines, uh, all of which we are trying to identify. But all of these 10,000 lines, we even have an image of that uh, molecule that is responsible for it in this, uh, in this region. So it's really an enormous jump forward, uh, also in terms of data collection and big data, that we now have uh, this, uh, this ALMA. So here are some of the molecules that we just uh, identified in this region. Uh, uh, making a step actually going from two carbon molecules to three carbon molecules, molecules like propanol, like acetone, uh, that we are now detecting uh, as being oxides, uh, all molecules that are new uh, for uh, the solar mass uh, protostars. Uh, and another molecule that we just uh, discovered is uh, methyl uh, isocyanide, um, a molecule that actually has sort of basic uh, chemical bonds of uh, what is uh, of a peptide molecule. Uh, so these are uh, molecules that are then called prebiotic molecules um, because of their sort of the basic building block for, for peptides. Um, so, but just as a warning, that even though this particular molecule is called a prebiotic molecule, it's actually an extremely toxic molecule and was actually uh, sort of the result of lots of the, the, the Bhopal disaster that, uh, that happened here uh, in, uh, in India. 
So be careful that this word prebiotic certainly doesn't mean uh, that it's uh, not a, a very toxic molecule uh, here on Earth. Okay, so let's now go back to our uh, um, exoplanetary systems, our planet exoplanets, um, and the diversity. So let's try to put all this, all of this together. Um, because if you look here, this is actually an engraving from 1798, an English uh, engraving. Um, and this particular artist already speculated about the diversity of, of other solar systems. In fact, he called it the universal solar system. This was our own solar system that was known at that time. Uh, but here you see all of these other um, solar systems as you mentioned them. Some of them with small, less planets, some of them with more planets, some of them closer by, some of them further away, uh, some of them with comets uh, or uh, other uh, objects uh, on exception orbit. And of course, that is exactly what we see now uh, with the Kepler satellite and other data, um, <coughs> this enormous diversity. But the point is, the answer to this question as to what the diversity is of all these different systems must lie in the past when the planets were formed from the circumstantial disks. So, how do they actually form? Here is the, the exoplanets. This is these tiny little dust particles that we have been observing. And somehow we need to make this bridge here going from sort of millimeter size objects to objects like the size of our Earth, which are 10,000 kilometers. How does that happen? We don't know. Unfortunately, you cannot observe this, this, this part. You can never observe a brick, just a brick in space. You can sort of look at the remnants in our own solar system, yeah? but that happened already for now, a billion years ago. So somehow, we need to start to link this part to that part, and that is where a lot of the scientific activity is at the moment. What we think that is actually important to hear is so-called snow lines. If you cover your grains with a little bit of ice, uh, then actually they stick together easy, more easily, and that actually promotes planet formation. So here's a beautiful example of a snow line in nature where you have sort of water going from uh, the, the solid form to the gaseous form here in this region. And so these kind of snow lines also happen in these disks, and in the disks from which our own solar system was formed, uh, where you have close to the star, it's very hot, you have sort of rocky uh, bodies, and further away it's very cold, icy bodies. And so here is where the snow line is of water, and uh, by accident or not, the big planets like Jupiter and uh, uh, Saturn, the giants that we have in our own solar system, are all located uh, just behind these ice lines. And you know, every molecule has its own ice lines because they have slightly different <coughs> volatilities. We have a water ice line, we also have a carbon monoxide uh, ice line. Uh, I mean, I'm starting to image also some of these snow lines, some of these ice lines with Alma. I won't go into the technical details, but just show you some of these beautiful images that we're starting to get, uh, where sort of these uh, uh, chemical tracers actually tell us where carbon monoxide and uh, sometimes also water is frozen uh, out. Okay, so let's uh, look actually what we think that is uh, happening uh, here. Um, Yeah, it's playing. <laughs> so here you see actually again one of our uh, protoplanetary disks um, and say, an animation. And we're going to zoom into that and we're going to see sort of these uh, rocky bodies there, and sort of these planetesimals. You should think of them of uh, maybe several uh, meters. Uh, and two kilometers uh, eventually in size, and they basically collide with each other. Sometimes you break something apart, sometimes they stick to each other, and they form larger and larger uh, bodies that uh, uh, eventually become the building blocks, basically, of, uh, of new planets. And we're starting now to see some of these uh, building blocks of uh, this Alma again. This is a very famous image uh, of Alma taken just a few years ago, where we're starting to see sort of these dark rings, uh, the size of which are the sort of the orbit of, of Neptune, um, which uh, uh, are indicative of the regions where planets are this, at this moment are being formed. And in fact, these are some of the other images that we are now getting with Alma, 
regions indeed in which a planet uh, that is likely sitting here inside is actually carving out sort of this region, this inner region of the disk is basically accreting the gas and dust in that, uh, that region uh, and in that way uh, sort of being an indirect signature of the presence of planets actually in these uh, disks. And another uh, sort of to show sort of the progress that is happening in this field now very rapidly, uh, another image where we can even start to see some of these uh, gaps and holes uh, occurring on, on sizes of the, the Earth, orbit of our own Earth. Okay, so if you want to look at the big pictures, we've talked about these small dust grains, very chemically rich. They stick together, they form these larger bodies, these planetesimals, sort of kilometer size, then eventually these go together to make planetary embryos, sort of lunar-sized uh, objects, uh, which then uh, eventually uh, um, uh, then can uh, collide and uh, form something like, uh, like our Earth. Now, an important intermediate step here is getting to these kilometer-sized objects. And this is, of course, also exactly the size of uh, that comets have. And so comets really are an important boarded building block for that size of objects of daily planetary systems. And thanks to studying now the comets in our own solar system, we can learn something about the chemistry there and start to relate it to us what we see in interstellar space. Because these should be largely preserved. They have been sort of in a decrease in the outer part of our solar system. And uh, when they come close to the sun, uh, they're still quite pristine and we uh, should be able to tell sort of their chemical composition and, and compare it with what we see in interstellar space. And of course, the Rosetta mission was provided a prime opportunity in order to study one particular comet, this, this very uh, weird-looking duck, sort of, uh, in more uh, detail. So, uh, this Rosetta mission actually had a very good nose. Uh, it was called uh, the uh, Rosina instrument, and it could sort of sniff the, uh, 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 the gases that were coming out of uh, this uh, this comet of uh, uh, dust, uh, rock, and, uh, and ice. It found quite a number of well-known molecules that we were expecting. Uh, but then there was actually one molecule that we didn't expect at all there. That is actually a very important molecule, which is actually molecular oxygen, uh, that was present in quite substantial amounts, actually, in this, uh, in this comet. So this showed already that, again, one of these periodic molecules, molecules that we think are important for uh, life, and maybe even molecules that could be biosignatures in uh, exoplanetary <coughs> atmospheres, that they are present already in the building blocks of those uh, planets. In fact, uh, the Rosetta mission has uh, detected a variable zoo of uh, chemist uh, uh, molecules here uh, in, uh, um, in this uh, particular comet's uh, range, ranging from the very smelly molecules <coughs> like H2S uh, to the more exotic molecules uh, like uh, sugar molecules or ethylene glycol that we have been talking about, uh, to uh, sort of the smelly uh, manure stone molecules like ammonia, methylamine, uh, that's here from the zebras. The king, of course, of all, actually glycine has been detected in this uh, particular comet, the simplest amino acid, uh, to sort of the long carbon chains, the alcohols, uh, etc., and finally the sort of the, the beautiful and the solitary, the, the noble gases, the noble beasts, actually, that you see uh, over here. Okay, so can we make a snake between what we see in comets and what we see on our own Earth and what we see in interstellar space? Well, that story is still unfolding, but missions like the Rosetta missions are very important in order to, to make them connections. And for example, one of the connections that uh, uh, scientists are making is uh, in the sort of the amount of heavy water that is present in our own oceans compared with what we see in comets and uh, what we see in other icy bodies in our solar system. And the similarity between these ratios suggests that, that there is at least some uh, reservoir of uh, icy bodies with the, the sort of the right uh, composition of uh, water uh, and also organics that uh, could have brought some of that material on, uh, on our own Earth. On the other hand, uh, in the more mature uh, exoplanets, uh, scientists are searching building new telescopes like the ELTs in order to search for the, the signatures of life actually on those planets. If you look at our own Earth, then one of the signatures is indeed ozone and water uh, besides CO2. Um, and this is uh, uh, indeed one of the goals actually uh, of the ELTs and other space missions in 
your finance. And then especially look at that for planets that lie in the so-called habitable zone where water is actually uh, possible in liquid form. So is that life on the nearest planets? We don't know yet, but I've given you at least some arguments as to why we can expect that on some of those planets in outer space, there could actually at least be great ingredients uh, to make uh, life uh, possible. And we can start to address them, these questions that I asked at the very beginning are we alone? Uh, there's even more sort of of these nearby objects that we can use <coughs> as uh, targets, like this very uh, interesting Trappist 1 system that was discovered uh, just a few months ago, uh, where we have even three habitable planets uh, in uh, uh, the first like planets in the habitable zone uh, around this uh, star. So, Gradually, we're starting to put together the, the whole story, going from these uh, very diffuse clouds, going through the collapse of these clouds, forming molecular complexity, going through these disks, uh, which planets can form, going to the planetary systems, maybe going to comets, where you can have uh, molecular complexity. Um, and then eventually, when a star runs out of its nuclear fuel, also returning some of that chemical back to the interstellar medium and then starting the whole cycle yet again. So, the summary, I think we see that a lot of these chemical ingredients are present. Planetary systems are possible around the majority of stars, but we don't know yet what kind of planets are formed and in what amounts. Chemistry on solar system scales is now being leveled with the new instrumentation. So hopefully we can get some insight into how we were formed or not. Thank you very much. You mentioned about uh, matter silicates and inorganic uh, chemicals condensing in the dark cloud. What is there that makes them condense there, concentrate there, where they can be everywhere around in that place? What makes them come together in like a particular cloud? Oh, you mean how is the silicate made? Yeah. yeah. Uh, all these chemicals that you mentioned. Uh, yeah. Like the dark cloud yeah. is actually made up of a lot of chemicals in that core area. Yeah, so we have the ingredients in terms of yeah. the various elements. But, so the, uh, when we talk about uh, the, the, the silicate grains, those are actually made in the, the final stages of uh, late stars when they die off and they mm -hmm. return their material to the uh, interstellar medium. Those are conditions, high temperatures, high densities, that's when you basically condense out uh, uh, silicates uh, materials and also some uh, refractory uh, carbonaceous material. And once you have those seeds, then you know the individual elements in the much more tenuous <coughs> solar medium can actually come together, sort of on such a grade. So you can you can see actually an interstellar grade a little bit as a, a meet and greet place, <laughs> where uh, the various atoms come together uh, to meet and greet. Uh, Good evening, Professor. Uh, we started the talk with uh, talking about dark clouds. I would also like to know the difference between a dark cloud and dark matter. So is there a lot of things, like how do we differentiate? I mean, of course, there is molecules in the dark clouds which you have mentioned, but how would, how would it be different from dark matter? Uh, yeah, so dark means really dark in terms of uh, the optical light that we can see with our own eyes. So this is all uh, baryonic matter that we are talking about. So this is the other part that is uh, that we can actually see, either with our own eyes or with other instruments. Um, so the part of the universe that we actually know what it is. And the dark matter is the part that we can definitely not see. <laughs> and it's a little bit, unfortunately, a fortunate nomenclature that uh, it suggests that uh, we don't know yet what it is made of, even uh, the, the dark matter. But it, we know it comprises a significant fraction of the universe. Yeah. But it, it, it's not molecules because those we can see. Yeah. Good evening, Max. Ma'am, uh, you mentioned about uh, molecular fingerprints, right? So the telescope gets the data and then you match with the frequencies. So what if uh, the data is not matching with the frequency? How do we associate to the chemicals? Ah, yeah, very good. Uh, we have a lot of unidentified lines. Um, so when uh, I have these 10,000 lines, uh, probably 20 to 30 percent of those lines we have not yet identified as a, this is a specific molecule. So this is where a lot of laboratory uh, work comes in in order to uh, basically uh, identify uh, what the molecule is responsible for that uh, signature. 
Um, so we actually think that a lot of those lines which we cannot identify now are actually belong to known species, uh, but once in a while there are lines that we really cannot assign. Uh, and that is then when the real detective story starts together in interactions with chemists and molecular physicists as to um, what that um, molecule could be. And that's how the, sort of the new molecules get discovered. Um, but the bulk of these, uh, these lines are usually due to molecules that we know already, but some isotope log of it or some other isomer or, or something like that. So, is there any little chance that you can use some other elements? That's good. Can these elements be elements that are not found on Earth? Oh, elements not found? No, yeah, well, you <laughs> know, all the elements in the periodic table, that's what they are, yeah, but no, no other surprise uh, elements. Yes. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, all the life forms that we know on Earth, uh, they have a very wide range of. Uh, conditions uh, in terms of temperature, pressure and various other conditions in which they can exist from the bottom of the ocean to the uh, highest heights in the atmosphere. <clears throat> so uh, that is one and the second is that uh, you know we may want to uh, accommodate uh, life forms which we have not yet seen or which we have not yet known who can exist outside of these parameters. So my question is, how is the definition of habitable zone uh, arrived at by consensus? Right, right, yeah. That's a very good, a very deep question. That uh, could take a long time to, to answer. So first of all, when I was talking about life, I was not talking about intelligence life, like uh, humans that we, that we know. It's, it could be any form of primitive life uh, also. Um, the basic ingredients of all the definitions of life is that it needs liquid water in order to, to start that. You can think of other um, liquid forms like uh, liquid ammonia or liquid methanol. But there, are, there are many good arguments as to why that is much less likely or even impossible compared to this water itself. Uh, so in that sense, looking just at uh, the region where water is liquid is at least a, a zero's order starting point for it. Yeah. 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 Okay, I would like to know because uh, all the metals which are present in the uh, atmosphere uh, in the interstellar space is uh, composed of carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, and nitrogen. But why? Because phosphorus uh, ah. should give the more uh, preference because it is the, the most uh, biological element. Yeah. Yeah. So, but why uh, the astro uh, chemistry is not focused? Towards the uh, phosphorus. Of course, phosphorus. Well, it is, but it's just much harder to find. Uh, so, uh, so there, there are several phosphorus molecules. Uh, PO, PM, I've and CP detected. Is CP is there, yeah. Uh, but uh, just the abundance is so much lower than uh, of these other elements. It's just even even with ALMA, uh, these are very difficult to detect. Yes. But I, even I, I have seen like it is thirteen most uh, abundant element. In yeah. Yeah. So still, uh, we are lacking in but the, yeah, but it's still it's still uh, at least one or two orders of magnitudes below the other elements, and so then it's uh, uh, then sort of the signals can also be overwhelmed by the signals from all of these other molecules. So it's a hard search is going on, but uh, it's uh, it's not easy. Because to, if we to, want to like, uh, talk about the interstellar light, like so, uh, light, then yeah. it's like. Always we have to always focus on, on, on the phosphorus. Yeah, so no, I mean, I, I, I fully agree with you. We are pushing the instruments uh, to, uh, <laughs> to get them. Thank you. Thanks, thank you very much indeed.